On the origin of life, I, I think this is a good book. Stephen Meyer. Um, you said you might want to get him on the show sometime. Yeah, I think Stephen, awesome. if you're watching. Awesome, if we could. Yeah, Signature in the Cell is is his discussion about the mystery of the origin of life and, and many other things. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let's talk about origin of life. So um, it is hard to define life, but we do have a sense of what we mean when we say a living thing. I, that's not a vacuous statement. Right. But, um, so, and, and then the, the question is, where do living things come from, how they arise? And, um, and this is a big conundrum because essentially uh, when, we, when we recreate the conditions of the early earth under which presumably life arose, and that we, don't, we know that life appeared, okay? But when we recreate those initial conditions, uh, they do not uh, conduce uh, to the chemistry that is necessary for a living thing to come into existence. Okay. Um, so, you know, we can recreate the atmosphere of the early earth. We can recreate what we think the early oceans might be. We can do that in a, I don't know, in a in a laboratory and create this artificial environment. And then we, we just leave it and watch it. And what happens? A whole lot of nothing. Okay. And so like, well, nothing's happening. So let's create some excitement. So let's, let's s stimulate lightning, right? Let's, let's create some lightning zaps and, um, and lightning also creates a whole lot of nothing. Now, uh, folks might say, well, I thought you, we could get amino acids from lightning. Well, Okay, this goes back to a famous experiment called the Yuri Miller experiment. Miller and Yuri created what they believed to be the atmosphere and the conditions of the early Earth, and then they put electrical pulses through it to stimulate uh, electricity to uh, ah, simulate lightning, and uh, they got a bunch of amino acids. Not all the amino acids that we need, but they got a bunch of them, and uh, and that was really cool. And that that is basically the last advance that we've had in origin of life research. Uh, to this day, when we simulate the conditions of the early Earth and maybe shoot simulated lightning through it or whatever, uh, we can't get beyond amino acids. Like, now I probably should explain what amino acids are. <laughs> they... Okay, so amino acids, there's roughly 20 of them, and they are the bricks that make up proteins. Um, so proteins are like nanomachines or sometimes the parts that make up nanomachines in our cells. And if you look at a cell under, you know, electron microscope, you know, it's, it's really amazing what's going on down there. And there are simulations of this or, or visualizations of this. Drew Barry is a famous uh, visualizer. And uh, maybe we can put up for our viewers some of his mm -hmm. uh, animations of what's going on inside a cell. But it's really amazing when you see that and, uh, and, and Drew Barry has gone around and done like TED Talks and so on and show his illustrations of what's actually going on inside of a cell. And his, his little videos produce gasps and just awe uh, in audiences because we tend to think of a cell as, you know, oh, it's just a moving blob of jello or something that's going on like this, not very sophisticated. But those that actually work in this area say that an individual cell is as complicated as, say, New York City. You know, so when you go down and you get down to the molecular level, you've got all these transport mechanisms going on, like trucks moving things around within a city, and you've got these complicated information transfers happening, and, you know, energy is coming in, and energy is, is being produced, or as it should say, fuel is coming in, energy is being produced, and chemicals are coming in, and chemicals are being expelled, all to, you know, keep that homeostasis, that, that, uh, that equilibrium that a living thing needs uh, so that it stays alive. So all of this is, is absolutely um, amazing. So how, how close can we get that to that? How, can, how close can we get to creating a, uh, a cell? Well, okay, we can recreate the conditions of the early Earth, and when we do that, at most all we get is amino acids. What, were, what are amino acids? If, if, you think of, uh, if you think of a protein as like a, uh, you know, making a little robot with uh, Legos, with Lego bricks, 
then the amino acids might be analogous to the individual Lego bricks. So a little part with two bumps on the top, you know, or something like that. Okay. So you take a bunch of those, like roughly 20 different kinds of amino acids and you put them together and uh, you can make a protein which uh, has a function and it gets its function from its three-dimensional shape, how it moves around. Maybe it can cut things, maybe it can join things and it does that in the cell. Uh, to support life. Okay, so really amazing. But we can't get to the proteins because the proteins require information. Okay, the way proteins are actually made in the cell is that the cell itself pieces amino acids together one at a time the way a child or you would piece bricks of Legos together one at a time to make a machine. So they piece them together, the amino acids together in a very long string. And then when the st once the string is ready, there's other um, uh, organs in the cell that take the string and fold that string up into a kind of like a biological origami. And when it comes out, it's in a three-dimensional shape that can cut or splice or attach or transport things or do any number of different uh, things for, for the cell. So that's all very amazing, but organelles that, um, that construct a uh, protein um, within the cell have to do that from a script that's provided by the DNA in the cell. And the DNA contains the, uh, the script for what amino acids to attach uh, to each other in a chain in order to get a protein of uh, whatever function. So just like you get the, the box of Legos and you pull it out and it's got the instruction thing like, oh, I got to attach this, I got to attach that, and you follow along and then you get you know, your little shark or your airplane or whatever it is that, that you were building. And so that requires uh, information. What can we get from the conditions of the early earth? Well, we can get some, some Lego bricks and nothing beyond that, okay? We can't get carbohydrates, which are sugars, which are burned for fuel. Um, we can't get lipids, which are fats that create the, the cell wall mm. that uh, protect it from the exterior environment. We can't get uh, ribonucleic acid or any nucleic acids um, uh, either um, because, um, well, for a number of different reasons, they're, they're too complicated to be formed under ambient conditions. But also, um, there, there's a water problem. Proteins and nucleic acids are linked together by a process that's called dehydration synthesis. Okay, it's... it's they're, they're joined by removing a water molecule. Mm -hmm. um, we imagine that the early earth was very watery. Um, so this is not going to take place in water because if you submerge proteins and DNA and RNA and so on in water, unprotected by a cell wall and unmanaged, just in the ambient environment in the ocean, they're gonna break down from a process called hydrolysis, which means degradation by water or breaking apart by water. So this, this creates in uh, Origin of Life research what's called the water problem, which is kind of a catch-22, which is if you're trying to get a living thing, all living things need a lot of water um, in order to live. But unfortunately, um, the molecules that you need to be, build a living soul, living cell, excuse me, typically break down in water. So that means that... The, the usual scenario that's presented to high school biology students and to people who visit a museum of natural history, we all know this, right? You go to the museum of natural history, you walk into their film room or their amphitheater, and they're going to show you a, a film about life, the mystery of life. And it always begins like, on the early earth, there was a pool of organic soup. You know, and like, you know, pool of organic molecules. They never explain where do these organic molecules come from. That's, that's a whole problem in itself. But then, and then, um, and then, you know, something like there was a strike of lightning or something like this, or or they don't even say it. By the the narrator doesn't even say it, but you see lightning zap the pool, you know, and then and then maybe they animate some kind of single celled creature or an amoeba, you know, kind of emerge from the pool, and and oftentimes they they try to have the narrator not say a whole lot mm. because they know that this is. Uh, <laughs> 
a false scenario. They, they, they know the, the scientific problems with this. And, and really, that whole scenario, and, and that really comes from a letter that Charles Darwin wrote to a friend. Really? And in, in, in Darwin's entire Origin of Species, he never deals with the origin of life. He didn't write a book called The Origin of Life. He wrote a book called The Origin of Species. He just presumes life from the beginning. He never tackled how life could, could arise from the beginning. But in a letter to a friend, he said, oh, maybe on the early Earth, there could be a pool of organic molecules and blah, 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 like that. And, and we've taken that and run with it. But, but let me explain why that's pseudoscience, okay? The, why these films that play in so many museums around our country um, and, and that scenario that's, that's presented in images and in biology textbooks, that is pseudoscientific, okay? F folks that work on origin of life know that you're not going to get life forming in a pool of water. And that's because of the water problem, because water is going to break down. Okay, so contemporary scenarios, we could talk about them in a minute, but they don't include having it in a pool of water. All right. Fred Hoyle said there was no pool of, uh, of organic soup, either on this planet or any other. You know, he had done a lot of research on this and what we call astrobiology. But anyway, so... That's not going to happen. The, um, the molecules that you need are going to break apart. They're not going to aggregate. They're not going to form in a pool of on the early earth. Secondly, if you strike them with lightning, <laughs> since when does lightning bring things to life? I'm thinking okay. of the flash. It's interesting. A lot of our superheroes have these origin stories where chemicals right. are spilled, supernatural right. gifts are imposed. And I wonder if this idea kind of comes from right from this pseudoscientific idea well it's all like like our, our superheroes are exposed to radiation that yep. kills you okay <laughs> radiation makes you sick it doesn't give you superpowers you know or, or they're exposed to toxins well toxins like why it kills you you know so we have the it's all magical thinking is behind our sci-fi and uh but to your question the lightning the lightning yeah. lightning is hotter than the surface of the sun lightning is you know i, I don't have the exact fi figures but the the amps and the volts and lightning are you know crazy large and you just unleash all of that electricity into a pool it's going to kill anything it's going to sterilize the pool you know it's not going to bring uh, a living organism into existence. And so why are we showing this to our children? So, uh, a scenario that we know to be false. Okay, the molecules aren't going to form in water. And if you zap them with huge amounts of electricity, that you're going to sterilize them or blow them apart, you know, and, and yet this is, this is what's presented. So, you know, on this whole, you know, I'm not a, an expert in the you know, in researching origin of life, but I can understand the works of those who are. And I'd really recommend James Tour, uh, James M. Tour. He's a, uh, a synthetic chemist at Rice University. He's got his own YouTube channel and hours and hours and hours of, um, of, of class instruction, essentially, on origin of life where he exposes this. But he, he points out the the fact that th there is no science behind this pool of organic soup model, and that, in fact, um, we can't get uh, the four classes of um, biomolecules that we need for life. We can't get them in a recreated uh, environment of the early Earth. We can't even get them in contrived environments in a lab, okay? So what are those carbohydrates, lipids, um, nucleic acids and uh, proteins, okay? Those are the four classes of compounds that you need for a, uh, a living cell. Um, and we can't make any of them in a lab using prebiotic ingredients alone, okay? Now you might say, oh, we use proteins or nucleic acids all the time in a lab. Yes, and we're always deriving them from things that are already alive. If we limit ourselves to the chemistry that's available on the early Earth, even with all our, um, you know, laboratory apparatus, we can't produce usable glucose, for example. We can't produce, um, you know, a whole string of proteins. Sometimes we can, you know, do, you know, high energy experience where experiments where we produce a whole mass of compounds and buried in there is some carbohydrates or buried in there is something else useful. But... Um, but uh, not, in a, not in a form that we could ever use or do further chemistry with it. Okay, so we're really at a standstill. And, and you know, one of the things about origin life research I want to 
emphasize, Matt, is that the, the question of the origin of life is not the question of can we as human beings uh, recreate a cell? Can we ever figure out how to make life, make some kind of synthetic life ourselves? Uh, we're at a standstill at, at, at that, you know, even that point. But really, origin of life is, is not about us making a cell. It's about how a cell just happened by chance on the early church. You know, how do the ambient conditions of the early earth just give rise? So we know we can recreate the conditions of the early earth and we know what happens. Nothing. Okay. Mm. A whole lot of nothing. All right. So this, this, well, then how did it get there? Well, this is like, this is like the question of the big bang, you know? Okay. Life uh, does uh, living things do not naturally aggregate um, under ambient conditions, okay, under, under natural conditions, you know. So the laws of physics and chemistry on the early earth alone will not pull the molecules together and do this. We know, we've tried, we know they, they don't. If you want to, you know, if our, our viewers want a, a, a good uh, expert uh, to follow in this area, uh, Dr. Brian J. Miller um, he contributed a chapter or two to this book, which I also want to advertise, which is God's Grander, The Catholic Case for Intelligent Design. I've got a chapter in scripture, on scripture in this, uh, in this volume. Um, Dr. Miller has a couple of chapters in there as well. He's an expert on thermodynamics, and he can explain why uh, thermodynamic law prevents the spontaneous formation of the very complicated molecules that you need for a living thing. Mm. Uh, under, you know, just uh, undirected conditions and make it difficult even under directed conditions. Um, so anyway, so getting back to this, what do we know about life? We know that life arose. We know that it can't happen by natural means. We know that laws of physics and chemistry alone won't do it. We know that life requires a lot of intelligence. This is the argument that Meyer makes uh, in, in, in this book. We need, we need those instructions. We need those Lego instructions. And then we need something also to follow the instructions. And this is like a terribly intractable chicken and egg kind of catch 22 problem. You know, we need the instructions and we need something that can follow the instructions and we need a whole lot else. We need something to protect the whole process from water, but we do need water. Okay. But mm. only in con very controlled amounts. I never knew this, but our cells are very good at handling water and they handle water carefully because unrestricted water in the cell can do bad things. So it's got to be carefully controlled. And so every living cell, you know, has to manage the water intake and outgo very, very carefully. So anyway, so what is this suggesting? Well, natural processes can't do it. Okay. This is looking like we need intervention from outside. We need a, we need some kind of force and that force needs to be intelligent. And, and it's a force that we're not aware of and it's, it's not accounted for by, you know, the matter and energy and the laws of nature that we can see. So again, it's looking like the big old, the big man. All right. <laughs> the big All right. Guy. Very good. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like and subscribe.